scanning for audio. Right, and welcome to the Tin Dog Podcast, number 104. Sorry about the delay since the last podcast, but I must admit I found myself a little bit skint. Bereft of cash. Broke. And so, I've been spending my time rather actively flogging some of my rather beloved Doctor Who stuff, in order to make sure that I can pay for Christmas this year. This isn't a sob story, I'm just trying to stay ahead of the game. In saying that, if ever any of you have considered buying yourself a Whostrology, please feel free to buy it sooner rather than later in order to beat the pre-Christmas postal strikes. But anyway, that's not the important bit. The important bit is, well, we now have a date for the Waters of Mars. It's on in two weeks. Well, probably from the date this gets released, almost a week. Sunday the 15th of November at 7pm on BBC One. Probably in HD as well. Though what's going on with the BBC HD bitrate, I'll leave that for yourself to discuss amongst yourselves. So this time I think I'll be discussing three separate topics. First off, the dead shoes. The stories so far. Wanted, retired army captain for light household duties and fireside companionship. You're late. You said you'd be on time. Breakfast smells appetising, Mrs. Wibsey. Go and boil your head. Wonderful woman. Knowledge of giant maggots, superintelligent spiders, and prehistoric monsters a positive boon. What is it? Owl! Quickly! Let it's... me, let me. He was talking to it, muttering to it. Sleep again, you must rest. Sink your thoughts into my thoughts. Calm yourself. I'm not putting up with any more prevarications. I demand a few explanations. I'm so glad you've come. You see, I've been in need of a little company. They mostly come out at night. That's when stuffed animals go hunting. Who can be controlling these monsters? As somebody evidently is. What we do here, this is just a salvage operation. But why are they rampaging about, Noggins? That's the question, isn't it? Why are they going berserk? I never set out to do this. It wasn't the idea at all. I opened up the badger's brain using very tiny brain scissors. Inside were huddled the desiccated forms of insects. Dozens of them. They weren't flies, or ants, or wasps. They were hornets. (laughs) They'll kill you. I've heard them whispering, humming, making plans. They hate you. Leave mankind alone, I warn you. We have waited so long for you to come back into our lives. I'm sorry, Mike. I've invited you somewhere teeming with terrible dangers. I don't care about that, Doctor. But why? And why did you make Noggins bring them all here? Since that first encounter in the factory, I have fought them again and again through time. Quick, the cellar. We can make a barricade. It looks rather like an all-night vigil coming up, Doctor. I'll pour the tea, and we'll make ourselves comfortable in this musty old cellar, and then... Yes? I'll tell you all about the mystery of the dead shoes. That's the second Tom Baker disc, and again it's more of the same. It's still nothing more than a glorified companion chronicle. And to say that Mike Yates is in it is kind of stretching the truth. He's at the very beginning, he's at the very end, but most of it takes place in 1930, and again it's told in past tense. It's got some great phrases, just like the last one. But it feels like Tom Baker, not quite the fourth Doctor. Perhaps because this is all we're ever going to get. I'm still craving for that big finish feel. 
The writer's obviously gone for some sort of twist on the time travel thing, the Doctor's taking on the adventures in reverse. But surely this means he could just skip to the end, rather than back to 1800 for the next instalment. I did consider not bothering with the rest, and perhaps that says more than any review could. But of course, I'm a glutton for Doctor Who, and so there will be a review of the next disc when it comes out. But enough of that nonsense. Let's talk about something a little bit more wholesome. Sarah Jane Smith. We'd had a truly great season opener. The Jadoon were well thought out and well done, and we've got six stories and six weeks to run through. Now you do get the feeling that the reason it's on two episodes per week is because someone kind of messed up. They had to have the third story, the one with the Doctor in it, on Before Waters of Mars. Next week's story is a ghost story, which, if it had been done properly, would probably have been broadcast on Halloween. And of course last week's story did mention Dreamland, the forthcoming animated story. It mentioned Dreamland and had the designs of the Roswell spaceship. So goodness only knows when that's coming our way. And so, now that we're established back in the series, we get the second story, 3.2. Or, if you were naming episodes a bit like Friends, the one where K9 comes back. I'm sorry if that's a spoiler for some people, but as it was on a fortnight ago, I'm just assuming you've seen it. They read our timelines. Ship showed Luke his past. All he needs now is a name. I like Luke. I like Luke. I'm going to miss you so much. And then his future. The darkness. What? The things she's seen. She showed Sarah Jane her whole life. I'm Sarah Jane Smith. I'm a journalist. Sarah Jane Smith. Danger, mistress. Don't forget me. Don't you forget me. And then her future, too. He's returning. He is coming back. What happened? What did that thing do to her? Bring her back. I want to think so. The darkness. I saw it in her mind. We need the darkness. It is our future. Honey, why did you show me that? thought it would stop the confusion in your head about your mum and GCSEs and boys and... I'm gonna end up like that. An old woman. Alone. I could feel it. I was so lonely. I saw this. I saw this future. My future. And I told myself I... Won't let that happen. Whatever I do, I won't become like that. I'm not gonna be alone. It's as if the writer was giving a shopping list, and perhaps he was. Number one, have an alienated youth. Number two, what's scary? Uh, I've seen Scooby-Doo, let's have a fair ground. Number three, get K9 back. Tick all the boxes, get in, get out, leave. Oh, and have a bit of a Wizard of Oz face in the mirror thing going on. Although in all fairness it wasn't actually the Wizard of Oz. It was much more Sleeping Beauty. Rather oddly, it had an ending very similar to how I imagined Ghostlight to have been, except, of course, that spaceship travelled at the speed of thought, which is a considerably cheaper effect to achieve. And after that story was on, well, we had to have the much-vaunted Doctor Who story. The Doctor Who episode. Here's the trailer. His name is Peter Dalton. We're getting married. Something so weird about this. Stop this wedding now! <laughs> Get away from me! My Sarah Jane Smith forever. Sarah! Time stopped. Time trapping. The trickster doesn't want us helping Sarah, so he's separated us. Trapped us in two different seconds. All you have to say is, I do. And if you don't... We'll remain here forever. Trickster! Oh, Sarah, without you lot, saving the world from your attic and healing, the chaos and destruction, we can drink to the trickster. Oh, oh, oh. You see, when you watch the previously on bit in episode 3.3.2, or 
the second part of this story, as it's known to human beings who aren't that ridiculous about naming episodes, you get the feeling that the Doctor was in it all along. But if you watch the episode, in the great tradition of all of the Dalek stories, he doesn't turn up until the very, very end, despite all of the TARDIS noises dotted throughout. It's very nice. But it did have the feeling of... Well, I don't know if anyone remembers that episode of Angel in Season 1 where Buffy turns up, and it felt a bit forced, a bit wrong. That's not to say it's not a deeply enjoyable story, and it truly, truly is. I would suggest you track it down somehow, and I'll leave your method up to you. No, it's a great episode, a great story. Touches of the sapphire and steel, canine at a wedding, and the fact that he trundles out from underneath the table, making enough noise to wake the dead, and nobody even turns around to go, What's that noise? No. Very, very worth seeing. With, of course, an obligatory nod to the classic series with a mention of Metabolus 3. Ah, bless him. Two more things before I end today's show. The first, rather curiously, is from Teaching Magazine, which is provided by the GTC. That's the General Teaching Council of England. It's a magazine that gets sent out to all of the teachers who, by law, have to be a member of this particular organisation whether they want to be or not. Anyway, there's an article on page 13 of this magazine called Teachers of the Fourth Dimension by David Lowbridge, assistant head of Bar Beacon Language College in Walsall, and he reckons that all teachers are time lords. Here's the article. As school children ourselves, we always suspected our teachers couldn't possibly be from Earth. Now we're on the other side of the desk. We finally know the truth. Teachers are indeed descendants of a race from another world. It's just that some of us have forgotten exactly which race and which world we are. We are, of course, Time Lords from the planet Gallifrey. If you require proof, look no further than your classroom. No one in Gallifrey in circles is a TARDIS, time and relative dimensions in schools. Contrary to the logic of established Doctor Who, your classroom may in fact appear smaller on the inside than it does on the outside but otherwise the two are strikingly alike. Your TARDIS is your starting point for those adventures in space and time with your companions. The most inspirational Time Lords don't see their learners as pupils or students, instead put them more of an equal footing, encouraging them to be participants in the learning process. Your companions will always look up to you, but that doesn't mean you'll ever look down on them. This extends to consulting them on where and when they want to visit, whether it's Pompeii on Volcano Day for geography, the Globe Theatre of the 16th century for English, or the end of the universe for physics. The TARDIS can take you all there. It goes without saying that our most famous fellow Time Lord, the Doctor, is a passionate advocate of cross-curricular learning. He may not have QTS, but he has a PhD in, well, everything. Naturally, there's a certain amount of healthy risk-taking involved with those adventures. Your companions won't know exactly where they're headed when they step through your TARDIS door. The fun part is you might not either. But even if the worst does happen, running into an alien race intent on enslaving humanity might just be worth putting in a risk assessment. They will know that as long as they're with you, they're in safe hands. Inevitably, your companions must eventually leave your TARDIS. This bitter parting of the ways is unavoidably bittersweet, bitter because you know they're going out, because you know they're going out of their timetables, possibly forever, sweet because everybody remembers their favourite Time Lord. Whether they're kindly and avuncular, or more like a funny older brother, rainbow scarved and swave booted, or be spectacled and skinny suited, a good Time Lord lives in the memory forever. Not a bad little article. And so until next time, be seeing you. You have been listening to the Tin Dog Podcast. Doctor Who and its associated shows are all trademark of the BBC. No infringement is intended. Contact us at Tin hyphen dog at hotmail.co.uk